welcome back to Project Kermit. So I said at the end of the last episode that the next job would be sorting out the middle of the Land Rover and that's still the plan. By far the biggest component that goes here in the middle is the seat box so that's what we'll sort out first. Now I did drag the seat box out um, a couple of episodes ago and I jet washed it. I've done almost nothing to it since. Jet washing all the filth off revealed that the structure of the seat box is actually really sound. It also revealed that this box here, which is where the um, battery's going to go, is completely shot. <laughs> it's full of holes. Uh, if you're wondering why this bit goes like this, I managed to clip it with a tractor while it was propped up outside the workshop. Shouldn't be too much work to do to this, but we'll know more when we get it on the bench and have a closer look. As we've seen then, the storage box on this side which will become the battery box that's <laughs> that's knackered on this side was this aluminium box i'm not sure if i'm presuming that uh, mark's dad made this up at some point in the distant past it's certainly not original but it is rather nicely done let's just strip down all of this lot and uh you will know what we're working with seat box is now stripped down and I've hammered it roughly into its proper shape. I've been looking at this, which of course goes under the passenger seat, and wondering why this bit is this section. And then I checked on the other Land Rover, which is a short wheel base, and on that one the chassis comes right down there. I think there's loads more room in Kermit. What I'm trying to say is we probably don't need to constrain ourselves to keeping this shape. We're going to offer this up to Kermit now and we'll have a look. In this angle you can see that the chassis on the long wheel base is completely different and therefore there's loads more room underneath the seat box than there is on the short wheel base. I don't think it's going to be deep enough. No, look at that. Mm. Pity because this one is nicely made. Wondering about what to do about this box and what to make it out of when it occurred to me that there's probably a reason why this is made out of steel and that's obviously strength. By attaching this to the seat base all the way along there and along there and along there and up there that really is going to really stiffen up the seat base which is <laughs> going to be super important when I dump a big battery on it. So that then decides the material. I'm going to make this out of steel just like this one is and this section here and that bit there and these bits are 2 mil steel. Um, this bit's thinner but because I'm not going to have this complicated section here I think I can make the whole thing out of one piece. So I've scribbled down some numbers taken from this. Um, we'll see how we get on.
got so focused on making this one look like this one, well, minus this little bit, that until just now it completely passed me by that we need a battery well in here. So checking back in the other Land Rover, you can see that the battery doesn't sit on the floor, it sits in the floor. <laughs> I'm going to try and do is once I've, so I've still got to make these edges, so this one needs to come up, that one needs to come in, that one needs to come up, and that one needs to come in. Once I've done those bits, I'll then cut down here and down here, and what I'm going to try and do is bend these two flaps down, and then I'll just make one piece that goes along, down, and like that. <laughs> Before the seat box gets reinstalled into Kermit, I've got to fit this, which is the gearbox uh, soundproofing blanket. Now remember, this is intended for a Defender gearbox, I'm not expecting it to just drop straight in, but I'm sure we can make it work. All it really needs to do is just to lie over as much as the gearbox and transfer box as possible, and just the idea is it absorbs some of the racket. One other thing I'll mention while we're here, um, it's been recommended to me that I fit another like a strut which would go from this gearbox mount to the engine. Or rather it would actually go from the gearbox cross member to the engine. And it prevents, well it dampens movement this way. It wasn't ever fitted to the four cylinder engines but it was fitted, as far as I understand, it was only fitted to the six cylinder engines. Now it does seem like a good idea, but I'm not going to fit it to this just yet. Because for one, I don't know if this gearbox is any good. I rebuilt the transfer box, but the gearbox is an unknown. And for two, we're actually missing a bit of the casing down here. That would be one of the mounting holes, and then the other one there is partly missing. That means even if I fitted the strut, it wouldn't be able to properly mount onto the bell housing here. 
So I'm just going to wait and see what, what it's actually like in when, when driving, see if I need that strut at all and uh, take it from there. And so the idea of this is you've just got a, uh, a load of mass inside this blanket which will absorb some of the sound energy coming out of the gearbox. And this is all because Land Rover's gearbox dates back to a 1930s design. <laughs> it's not really been optimised. Well, it was never optimised, was it? I think that fits well enough. Well, it fits not great, <laughs> but that's Land Rovers for you. It's going to work though. It's all going to work. So it turns out I've got to get these back out, put the floor, floor panels in, and then that one, that one goes in last. And at that point, I can do up all the bolts, clamping that in, seals back in. It'll be great.
done. <laughs> Got a few things to do up this end of Kermit. One of them fitting these bonnet catches. So these you see on some military vehicles and also the Camel Trophy vehicles have these. The way these work is that this part sits on the bonnet and the little receiver will sit on the wing and this is sprung loaded inside of here. Quite a stiff spring. So it will just provide some positive clamping force to grip the bonnet down onto the wing. That's the idea. I've got the side where to put these and then I'm going to paint these because I'm <laughs> I'm trying to do without any bare metal on the vehicle. That's my kind of idea. marked it here where it would be neutral without any tension on the spring and then I've just drawn a line about four millimeters this way and that'll be enough loading Get the other side in. Pretty cool. What I need to do in here is finish installing the pipes for the radiator and the reason I haven't done that just yet is because I was waiting on sorting out the oil pipes that go from the oil filter to the oil cooler and that was a bit of a saga. Essentially what I needed to do was to extend these pipes by 250 mil and I went down to my local hydraulic specialist who have been really helpful in the past and they didn't really want to know. <laughs> the reason I needed to extend this pipe rather than just fitting a new pipe is because although this end is standard BSP fittings this end is some strange Land Rover proprietary thingy so I had to keep these bits there isn't a uh, off-the-shelf part that you can buy that's that's longer what I wanted them to do was just to cut into this replace this hose basically with a longer one that would have done the trick but they said their machine wouldn't swage imperial sizes, which maybe that's true. <laughs> then it occurred to me, all I really had to do, being as this is BSP, is just get a bit of BSP um, flexi pipe made up. And that's what I did. So because the next nearest hydraulic specialist was miles away, I just went on eBay and I searched around and I found someone who would just make up a 250 millimeter pipe. I got a uh, swept 90 on one end and a fixed male on the other end. Now I didn't get any favours from this person but I will put their name up on screen because they were incredibly helpful, very cheap, they were the cheapest one I found that's why I went with them um, and I got the, it was really quick, <laughs> amazing service in fact. They must have made it up within an hour or so of getting the order. So anyway this was posted out, these will do the job. And so you can see how these seal together. You've got that dome on the end there and you've got something there to receive it and that clamps up. So I won't need any anything on the threads or any PTFE tape or anything like that. You can see where the seal is and it's just the same on the other end. 
The oil pipes are installed, but they're not secured just yet. I want to attach them to the inner wing somehow. Here's my plan to use this bracket, the original one, but take out this bolt and instead put these in there. So that will clamp the pipes together and then this bit goes through the wing, but with two loose nuts as spacers. And on the other side of the wing, big penny washer, split washer, and another nut. That's better. Whew, we're in. I almost got there with plumbing in the radiator. So the top hose is done, um, the intermediate hose, expansion tank, and of course those oil pipes are in. Now just the bottom hose, see that one there goes up to the expansion tank, and then I've had to cut it there. So what I'm going to do is order a 10 inch joiner piece. Just a straight joiner that will go from there to there. I don't want to just use a piece of pipe because um, a joiner piece is swaged at each end. So it has the, the beading on it, that'll, um, some, something for the Jubilee clip to grip onto basically. So that'll be a few days to turn up. Other than that, we're there. The mud shells have been blasted and one of them that's completely fine to go back into service. This one, there's a whole section here that's vanished and then there's a lonely pinhole right up there. So I'm going to cut out a, that sort of shape. We have a look under the bonnet then. There it is, and that concludes the plumbing of the cooling system. Now I'm filling this just with rainwater, just to check leaks. And, well if there are any leaks I'll have to fix them, but if there are no leaks I'll drain this out in a few hours and then put in an antifreeze water mix. And I mention all this because I've got a bit of a history of forgetting to put the antifreeze in. So come what may, we'll have that done today. So it's coming out of the bleed screw there, which is really good. That means the whole um, heater matrix is full of water. 
And then what I've done, just te for testing for leaks, I've completely brimmed that. And I'm going to go away and have lunch and come back, see if that's gone down. Two and a half litres of this, that will do us. Right, we're pretty much at level there, I think. Yeah, we're at level there, so that's good. Okay, that's good. Now I can put the air filter back where it should be. So I've dug through the stores and found some covers for the holes. I'm not sure if they came off of Kermit, these ones. Um, well, this one definitely didn't, it's the wrong colour. But they all fit nicely. Now, I'm not going to fix these down just yet, or even fix down these bits here, until I've decided what to do about the seats. So, I'm tempted to keep the original Land Rover seats, which I do find comfortable. But, I have in storage a full set of Discovery seats from my old Discovery that uh, I pulled apart <laughs> ages ago. Now they've been stored up here for years. They were in reasonable condition when I put them away, but I noticed uh, a while ago the cat's been living up here, so at the very least they're gonna be absolutely covered in cat hair. So I've never even offered these up to a Land Rover. So I don't know if I can use the seat rails that are on here or, or anything really. Or even if these seats are going to be any good. Oh, great, they are. Absolutely minging. I was going to say they're nice seats. They, they were nice seats. <laughs> I think the Discovery seats, the early ones, were designed by uh, Terence Conran. Uh, a name that probably doesn't mean anything to most of you. But um, I think he's most famous for starting Habitat back when it was an actual store. Anyway, like I say, they were nice seats. They're now absolutely even with cat hair. So am I. <laughs> I've, only, I've only just touched them. That is a great seating position now. I always forget there's more room in the 109 cab than there is in the in the short wheelbase. That's great. <laughs> I like that a lot. I'm going to try and make that work. Pretty cool. Good. I'm pleased with that. I'm glad I cut those now. Well, we've made some good progress here with the seat box, the battery box, the transmission tunnel, the floor, plumbing in the engine, even potentially finding some seats for it. I'm going to wrap up the instalment here by using the fact I've got a battery box to put a battery in it and start the engine. I've got the battery off the other Land Rover. <laughs> which fits. So that's a good start. I've got some big fat leads, battery terminals and such. Uh, I'm going to drill a couple of holes in the side here and just plumb it into the stark motor in temporary fashion. So I'm going to need to run the positive from the battery here up to the starter motor and then the negative will go from the battery here to the chassis and then we're going to need to put in a earth strap on the engine as well, also going to the chassis and some way of triggering the solenoid on the starter motor. <laughs> A fair bit. <laughs>
got a couple of long lengths of wire here and on each of them I've put a insulated uh, female speed connector and I'm going to put one length on the stop solenoid on the injector pump and then the other one I'm going to put on the start solenoid on the starter motor. Obviously <laughs> this is very temporary just intended to see if we can start it up. If I connect this to the positive we should hear a click. This will be the stop solenoid operating. Yeah. And if I touch the red one to the positive it should start the starter motor. The engine won't start because one there's no fuel in it and two the Stop solenoid isn't activated. Make sure I'm in neutral, just in case. There we go, cool. Better stick some fuel in it. So we've got fuel in the tank, we now need to get it up to the engine. The first step is to fill up this fuel filter, which of course is completely empty because it's not bad new. Slacken off this screw and then if we pump this by hand. Get in there. Alright, that's doing nothing. So the lift pump is completely loose, which hopefully <laughs> doesn't mean it's knackered, hopefully it just means it's in the wrong spot. So I'll just have to crank the engine a moment. Still nothing, that's... Well, what an anti-climax. <laughs> I'm sure the engine would start if I could just get some fuel in it. And somehow the fuel pumps just died in the night. Grief. Here's what we got then. This is the one I've just taken off Kermit. And there's no... Pretty much no feel there. It's not the sp this spring, this spring's intact, but it should be, well it should just leap back and it doesn't. So there's something wrong in there. This one I've just pulled off a scrap engine and this does have a much more positive feel to it, but <laughs> I don't think this one's service believer. It's, I think it's blocked in here. And with these type of lift pumps you can't dismantle it. On the older types um, you can pull them completely apart. I mean, you can actually get service kits with them as well. Yeah, <laughs> that's not going anywhere. This, this side just goes up and down. So this pump is no better than this pump really. It's just, a, it's just defective in a different way. Yeah, I see. I got one more engine to check. Might be able to take one off of that. Third fuel pump. Uh, this is it now. This is the last of my stock. Making a pumping noise. Well, we know this one works. There's still a gasket on the engine. <sighs> so now when I pump the, I was going to say new pump, <laughs> the replacement pump, we should eventually get diesel to come out through here and a load of frothing and then when the frothing goes down that'll be it bled through up to there.
getting bubbles from there. If there's bubbles, there must be diesel in there. Yeah, there we go, it feels loads better now. So, I bled through the crack of the injector pump now. I've slackened off number one, number one injector. Uh, it should start. Hearing that run again, that's a massive morale booster. Of course the next challenge is to actually make the truck move again, but that'll be for next time. Cheers for now.